Hello, hello, hello. How are you? Uh, this is Craig Beck from StopDrinkingExpert.com. Welcome into our weekly get-together. This is our little support session that is live across the internet on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, um, LinkedIn now as well, and Twitch as well. So wherever you're watching, you're very welcome. Uh, please like the video wherever you're watching. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel. And if you want to comment, uh, then I will see your comments wherever you post them, I promise. Uh, the time difference is still causing problems and still upsetting a few people. Uh, Victoria in Florida is very upset. She can't even join the stream today because the time difference is all out and she has to do something else. Uh, so what is happening? It's I believe it's 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time right now. Yeah, well, that's because the clocks in America went forward, what, two weeks ago? But they don't in Europe until this weekend. So hopefully this live stream will be the last one that causes problems for six months, and then we'll have the same problem in reverse, all right? So sorry about that. Uh, we'll be back to 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time next week. All right. So uh, this is a Ask Me Anything session. You can ask me anything you want. Any questions, any problems, what obstacles are you facing with your drinking? What's the big trigger for you? Bring it up today and I'll do my best to give you an answer. Uh, also want to hear from you if you're celebrating a sober anniversary, maybe you're one year sober or three months sober, six months sober, give yourself a mention. We'll give you a collective round of applause. All right. So let's say hello to a few people. Uh, James is here. James Blue Tents. Uh, and James, confused by the time as well. Sorry about that, James. Uh, Brad David is here uh, in Louisiana. Very good. Ellie is on board. Welcome, Ellie. Who else we got? Um, KB. KB's a regular. Good to see you back, KB. Uh, in Arizona this morning. Deborah is in Miami. Uh, K2. Good morning, group. Glad to be here. Peace to all. Very good. Uh, James is in Lower Manhattan. Very nice. I miss Manhattan very much. Uh, Julie Phillips is here from Dorset. Okay, very nice. Uh, Jan from Perth, Australia. we got Norway Lynn. Uh, good morning from Missouri. And we have Lindsay here as well. Hi, Lindsay. Virginia is in Western Australia. Chris Ball is here as well. And Chris says, uh, hi, Craig, nearly 15 months sober. You said you have about a 95% chance of failure if you rely on willpower. But what is the percentage of failure if you... <laughs> Manchester United, it must be pretty hard. Uh, that's why you should always read the comment before you read it out. I don't know. I'm not a football fan, uh, Chris. I can't stand football. I'm a rugby league fan. Uh, I'm a Wigan Warriors fan, if that means anything to anyone. Uh, but thank you for the comment. Very funny. Um, so Alicia is here in Texas. Angela from Sydney. Um Let's have a look. Erwin is here in the Netherlands. Are you all seeing me okay? Because I'm getting a few comments here that some people can't see me. Um, KB has said, is Craig late? Terry said, is there problems uploading? So if you're having problems, let me know what channel you're watching on and what problems you're getting. So fire your questions up and I will get to them as soon as I can. Uh, I wanted to just talk about one brief thing today, and it's not what I intended to talk about. I found something quite shocking online, and I just wanted to highlight it for your attention. I actually went online searching for a specific brand of wine to talk about, because I think it's really evil. And a lot of these brands of wine have quite well thought out and, you know, psychology-backed names. I remember drinking a lot of... Uh, a wine called the artisan or the artist or something like that. Names designed to make you think they're all kind of, you know, elite and boosting your social status. But I think the most, one of the most evil brands of wine is called Mommy's Little Helper. I mean, you have to be pretty narcissistic to bring out a brand of wine like that. So that's what I was looking for. But actually what I want to share with you is the Google search. Um, Okay, Chris says, I'm on YouTube, and the thumbnail keeps coming on and then off again. Anyone else getting that problem? Chris, just try uh, refreshing and uh, going back in and see if that fixes it. So what I wanted to share with you was the Google search that came along when I was looking for this wine. If you type Mommy's Little Helper into Google image search, it brings up an array of 
totally inappropriate products. Have you seen this? Wine glasses, Mummy's Little Helper. Uh, you've got, uh, what else have you got here? Here's the brand of wine I was telling you about. This brand of wine is called Mummy's Little Helper. You've got socks, uh, designed for mom as well. Uh, carafe. Uh, there are even bottles of wine down here. So there's Mummy's Little Helper on that one. And it's just so evil. Because think about what this is doing. It's It's suggesting that you can't be a parent without drinking an anesthetic. Parenting is so horrible and so terrible that you need to take a drug to get through it. I mean, that change the drug. Change it from alcohol to something else. Can you imagine if they were pushing, you know, solvents like that and tubes of glue had that written on it, Mommy's Little Helper? There'd be uproar, wouldn't there? There'd be outrage. But for some reason, we live in a world where everyone just laughs. Ah, oh, it's only alcohol. It's harmless. It kills three million people a year. It's just nuts. And I think the problem is you don't notice this stuff until you're outside the bubble. When you're inside the bubble, in that bubble of unreality around alcohol, you don't notice this stuff. You'll see it everywhere, but it'll have zero impact on you. When you step outside and you start viewing this problem from above, it's quite shocking. So that's what I wanted you to do uh, is just in the next week before we meet again, just have a look out for what you see out there because there will be things that have completely gone over your head in the past. You've just, you didn't see them. You were tunnel visioned by the alcohol. Post them up and let me know. What can you think of that you've seen that just shouldn't exist out there? I know I've seen, you know, you get those sippy cups that babies have. I've even seen some wine reference printed on those before. That's just shocking, isn't it? But if you've seen anything, please comment below. I'd love to hear what you've seen out there. Just wanted to share that with you today. All right. Um, so, wow, it seems like we got loads of problems on YouTube today. Uh, I apologize. I don't know what I can do about it uh, because it tells me I'm live. Uh, one moment. Yeah, it says I'm live. Can I view it and check? Just one moment. Okay. It looks like, um, yeah, it looks like we do have some problems. Okay. I'm not sure what to do about that. All right. Look, I'm just, it's work. Jill says it's working fine. It looks like this is, um, an intermittent problem. I, I apologize. I don't think there's anything I can do. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I'm not sure what's going on. Anyway, let's say hello to a few people. Hopefully you can hear me if you can't see me. Um, let's say hello to Laurie. Hi, everyone listening from Kentucky. Uh, Jules in Seattle. Uh, Jatu Finn is in Finland. Same time zone, by the way, and Kiev. Uh, good morning from PA from Flubber Flops. Uh, Paul Cooper celebrating three years on March 19th. Thanks, Craig. I use your materials often. Excellent. Uh, Tilly is here as well, and Sarah is here. Uh, we got Philip Lane from the UK on the Walkman. Really? Is it some retro thing? Or... <laughs> um, let's see if we've got any questions coming up here. Um, Edison. How do we best teach our kids about alcohol? I was shielded from it completely as a child, but then ended up becoming an addict when I was old enough to buy it myself. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, um, a lot of drinkers quote the French system as though it's a shining example of how you should introduce children to alcohol. And they say things like, well, you know, in France, uh, kids are given alcohol from the age of 10. You know, they have it with their meal and uh, that way they learn not to have a problem with it. They learn to not make it a big deal. Uh, but uh, there's not a great deal of evidence for that. The, the, you know, the wine consumption in France has always been high and 
just because you were introduced to it at an early age in a responsible way is not going to protect you from the damage that it does to you, is it? So I think, you know, that, that spin, it's a story being spun to, to tell a particular narrative that fits the people who are telling it. Um, there's so many problems with children and alcohol because, first of all, it's the, it's the, it's the perception that this is a magical substance that only adults are allowed to have that causes the first problem, I think. Because I remember being a kid and my parents would often have parties and they would invite people around. And the whole it seemed like the whole point of people coming around to the house was to drink this magical liquid. And me and my brother would be sent off to bed and we would listen. We would lie on the floor and listen uh, to what was going on downstairs. And it would slowly get more and more raucous. There'd be singing, there'd be dancing, there'd be laughing. And me and my brother, we used to just lie there thinking, what amazing things are going on down there. That, that liquid they drink must be just like the best thing ever. And it's, it's called the law of scarcity, isn't it? It's, we want what we can't have. And so as kids, we're kind of introduced to alcohol as though it's this glorious thing that we're told we can't have. And that's, that's the problem of drinkers, isn't it? Because it's very hard for a drinker to explain to a child, look, this stuff I'm drinking is going to give me cancer and kill me. It's very bad for me and it's addictive and it's causing me all sorts of problems. And because then the first question from the child is going to be, well, wh why do you drink it then, dad? or mom. And there's no answer to that. So we're just trying to hush kids away, don't we? So the, the only way to really, I think, set kids on the right path is to give them the correct information at an early enough age. Because if you leave it too long and they get into the teenage age, then if you've got teenagers, I think you're going to agree with me. Give me a yes in the comments if you agree with this. Once they get to be teen teenagers, they're not listening to anything you're saying. You're not cool. They don't want your opinion. You are the uncoolest person on planet Earth. So if you say to a teenager, listen, I know you've seen me drinking alcohol in the past, but I want to let you know this is really bad for you. And I would don't go near it. It's horrible stuff. It's going to take you down a dark path. They're just going to laugh at you. Because that's the mentality of teenagers. Their their brain mindset has changed. They're no longer looking for information from inside the family. Their mindset has broadened. Now they're looking for information that comes from outside of the family. And that's why you suddenly become uncool and they don't want to be any, you know, anywhere near you. So children need to be taught before they get to that phase, when children still have a little bit of respect for you, when they still listen to what you say and consider it to be the gospel. But unfortunately, because we're stuck in our alcoholic bubble, we don't have that conversation. After that point, I believe the only way you lead kids in the right direction is with your actions. It's not what you say. It's not what you order them to do. They're going to ignore both of those things. It's what you do. It's the way you live your life. It's a subconscious message rather than a, you know, a communication to their conscious mind. So by looking after yourself, by getting this poison out of your own life, you also kind of indirectly help your children get it out of theirs as well but it's it's a difficult uh, it's a difficult subject i'll agree with you on that um it looks like we're are we still having problems guys well deborah can hear me and see me clearly in miami kb i don't think laurie can't see me this is a complete nightmare youtube is completely screwing up we may have to just do a short one today, guys, but look, I'll do a few more questions and hope it comes good, but uh, it's, it's a bit of a technical nightmare today, I'm afraid. Uh, Tilly, three months sober, my question is, the people around me are still drinking. Makes me so sad when they're still drinking. I want to know what I tell them. I want to know what I tell them that they do not respect me. Um you mean you want them to stop drinking because you see them drinking poison and it upsets you? I get that. Unfortunately, it's a bit like um, it's a bit like someone who's quit smoking and goes up to all his smoking friends and says, "Oh, you know, why why are you smoking that filth? That's really bad for you. You're going to get cancer." 
it, it just the people you're preaching to don't want to hear it because they think whether they consciously think it or subconsciously think it it's debatable but they think that you are looking down on them they you may be saying this because you love them and you care about them and you want the best for them but in their eyes it's like you've elevated yourself above them and now you're talking down to them you with your lofty high standards, you the sober one, talking down and telling the lower person on the totem pole to stop drinking. And it causes them psychological pain. And they might not be consciously aware of why they're in pain. They might just oversimplify it by saying, you know, so-and-so's being sanctimonious. They don't realize that Somewhere deep in their mind, they know you're right, but they don't want to face it. They don't want to deal with it. So, that, look, the best thing I can say to you is don't preach to your friends. If they want to drink alcohol, let them drink alcohol. That's their choice. They're adults. They're humans. It's their choice. Now, where you can help, Tilly, is when someone comes up to you and says, I noticed you stopped drinking. You seem so much happier. You seem so much this. You seem so much that. Can you tell me how you did it? That's your invitation to give them it, you know, both barrels, to give them everything you know, to teach them what you know about alcohol and set them on this path that you've already taken yourself. But as, as horrible as it is, avoid the urge to preach to your friends. You'll just lose your friends. They won't stop drinking because you told them to, no matter how good your argument is. And I know this myself. You know, I put um, posts up on Facebook. And occasionally they land with drinkers, which is what they're supposed to do, I suppose. But people who are still in the bubble, still in denial, get super upset. No matter how good the post is, no matter how logical, no matter how based in fact what that post says is, they will come back with something either really horrible or laugh it off in some way. And that's what you're going to get from your friends as well. Um. That's a good point, actually. Um, Ronnie from Cleveland about wine bottles. Um, not just catchy names, but the tactile bottles. What is that French wine? Um, it comes the bottle. It's a, it's a French wine. Cote de Rhone, I think, something like that. And the bottle is all in, embossed. And it looks like even if you buy a bottle that was, you know, from a, a vintage of one year ago, it looks like you found this precious artifact. And spirit bottles are like that as well. They're, they're, they must spend a fortune on the design of the bottle because it's so tactile. It feels good in your hand. And it's just more narcissistic marketing, isn't it, really? Uh, Peter. Peter says it's working on YouTube. Glad to hear you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube and you're just getting the holding screen, I apologize. I have no idea how I fix that. I don't think I can. Um, Jewel says YouTube working fine for me. Uh, other people not having so much luck. Uh, Terry's reloaded. So have you got uh, have you got video now, Terry? Uh, Mick is on board. Our legendary cyclist Mick is on the stream. Um, let's have a look. I'm just scrolling through all the people saying I can't see you. Uh, Mateus from Bavaria, three weeks sober. Well done, my man. Very good. Three weeks. Keep going. Uh, Doug Burgess says, hello, all. Working okay for Doug. That's good. Um, Clifford in Derbyshire. Very good. Uh, Irwin says, it's fine now. Good. Um, Angry Orchard. Hannah says, Angry Orchard Hard Cider has a logo of terrifying looking trees. Um, we, you know, we've talk, we talk about this in boot camp. Um, there are some really horrendous names for alcohol. You know, there's things like the devil's blood and uh, lots of references to death and things like that. And you might think, well, that's crazy marketing. Why would you want to connect your product with something horrible like death or murder or blood? Or And if you think about it, the psychology on that is quite clever because... Alcohol is the panacea for drinkers, isn't it? We use it for everything. 
Problem drinkers use alcohol to relax. They use it to socialize. They use it to deal with anxiety. They use it to get to sleep and so on and so on. So if you see some scary image on a bottle that suggests if you drink it, you're going to die, whether it's real or just imaginary, you, you can feel a little bit on edge, just a little bit. But what do drinkers do when they feel slightly on edge? What do drinkers do when they feel slightly worried? They drink, don't they? So I don't, you know, don't look at these brands and think, oh, that's quirky, or they're having fun, or or they didn't put much thought into that, or they've made a mistake there. Trust me, these companies are spending millions of dollars on psychologists and uh, to work out how they pull on our addictive strings to have us choose their brand over another. It's really nasty stuff that's going on. The problem with the alcohol industry that is so much worse than was ever the case with the cigarette and the nicotine industry is the alcohol industry is portrayed as fun. You know, look at the TV commercials. What, what is happening in a TV commercial for alcohol? Well, I'll tell you what's not happening. There is not a person sitting on their own drinking. You don't see someone sitting on their sofa in their pants, in their underpants with a bag of Doritos and a bottle of wine in the other hand, do you? Watching TV like a zombie on their own. You don't see that, but I tell you what, I bet that's more reality than the four or five friends getting around for an amazing time together with just a couple of beers that the alcohol companies like to portray. It's all psychology and it's all evil. Uh, Kobe Katz, good morning. Past the kick in Texas. Nice. Um... Yeah, Chris, you know, Chris was talking here about the, you know, that fr the story of the French nation giving their kids alcohol from a young age so that they don't have a problem with it when they get older. It's nonsense. It, it, they do have problems with it, it's just the same as any other country. Uh, and like Chris says here, I was given wine with my meal on Sundays, but still ended up being a problem drinker. Yeah. Uh, Jules, your program is working so well for me. Doing all the steps, I've become a Craig Beck audio junkie. Lol. Now on day five of the 421 Journal, so happy to be free. Well done, Jules. Very proud of you. Uh, I will make a video about the 421 Journal this week, hopefully, because I think it's really helpful. Charles, we did start uh, on YouTube. Some people are reporting that um, they're not getting any video. Sorry about that. I don't know what's going on. Uh, Charlie Romeo Whiskey. Hi, Chris at all. Charlie here, messaging from the Canary Islands on a health trip, but lost two weeks of sobriety to a few pints of shandy. Wasn't drunk and no hangover, but still consumed a pint of beer mixed with lemonade. That said, I made some major progress over the last two weeks since starting this journey. So you had one pint of shandy uh, in two weeks. Charlie, is that right? Okay, look, it's not perfection, but it's not a disaster, is it? If that's all you had, it's not a disaster. It's not great. It's like, what, 2% alcohol, something like that. But try not to beat yourself up too much about that. Just kind of throw it over your shoulder. Carry on. You're doing well. Uh, Clifford, I quit drinking 11 months ago, lost two stone in weight, and reversed type 2 diabetes. Utter poison. It's amazing, Clifford. The other thing... Um, I don't know if you had a problem with this blood pressure. Blood pressure goes down from high from hypertension to normal levels so quickly. It's amazing the damage this stuff is doing that we just decide to overlook. Uh, Flubber flops, I can hear and see you clip there perfectly. Good, good. And Trish in Florida can see as well. Uh, Charles, I can see now. It took a while. I wonder what's going on with YouTube. Uh, Camilla in Sweden. We're on in Sweden, which is good. Uh, and New York as well. Great. Okay. And Mix, as you can see. All right. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, oh, but Kelly can see me on the laptop, but not the iPad. <laughs> it's the end of the world, I tell you. Um, Sarah. Uh, hi, Craig. Sarah, greetings from the UK. YouTube not working, but logged into Facebook and the live video is working. Okay. Um, now let's have a look and see what we got here. Apparently, refreshing the browser helps. That's what people are saying. Yeah, Marvin, have you noticed that in uh, TV adverts for alcohol? 
when the guys get the beers out, all the pretty girls turn up to drink with them. I don't know about you, but that's never happened to me. I've never heard ding dong. Oh, the girls are here. Anyway, um, Hannah says, live fast, die young advertising as if the edginess of taking poison makes us cooler, smarter, and somehow more real than people who choose natural health and wellness, uh, like a pirate identity. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, Hannah, it wouldn't even be that bad. It, well, it would be bad, but it would. They, they don't even admit it's poison, do they? They, they imply that it's harmless. And they always come back with the defense. You know, you say to the alcohol company, why are you advertising the product, this product that kills all, you know, 3 million people a year? And they say, ah, oh, well, you know, if you drink in moderation, it's fine. In fact, it might even be good for you. It's garbage. It's just a nonsense answer. It's not true. Kelly says, sad story from PA today. 21-year-old DUI kills two officers and a pedestrian on the I-95. She previously posted to social media. She was the best drunk driver. Yeah, it is sad. And there are a lot of people. Have you ever met someone who claims to be a better driver when they've had a drink than when they're sober? There are a lot of people around who hold that opinion, and they genuinely believe it to be true. Why? Would they think that? Um, could it possibly be true that they're a better driver when they've had a drink? Of course, the answer is no. The reason they think that they're, they're a better driver when they've had a drink is that they are less aware of problems. So they may be clipping wing mirrors all over the place. They're just not aware of it. And so that their illogical conclusion when they get to their destination probably quicker than they would have done if they were sober because they were probably speeding. They, they, they look at that journey and they go, wow, I'm a great driver. Just because they were, you know, they've taken this drug that reduces your ability to be aware of what's going on. Just because you're not aware of the damage you've done doesn't mean it has been done, but it's a, it's a crazy situation that's happening all over the world. Um, Trish says, I met several former drinkers at a Tony Robbins seminar I attended last weekend. One guy was six years in AA. He enjoyed the daily camaraderie, uh, but felt it no longer fit. I pointed him in your direction. Thank you very much, Trish. Um, I've never been to Tony Robbins, and I'll tell you why. Because I know that the day is like 14 hours long. They start at like 8 in the morning, and they're still going late at night. And I just, I, A, I haven't got the attention span. And B, I haven't got the energy. <laughs> I'd be doing a firework. I'd be burning my feet completely. Um, Philip Lane says, uh, do you see not drinking alcohol as, do you see not drinking alcohol as quitting? Okay, Philip, hang on. Do you see not drinking alcohol as quitting as that sounds like you're giving something up to me anyway? It's stopping doing something that is bad for me and has no benefit to me at all or anyone um i'm not sure it's that important philip it, it, it's it's mindset more than language isn't it um it, it's it's how you feel about what you're doing more than how you vocalize what you're doing um and it works the other way you know you can say anything you want but if you don't believe it if you don't believe that's true, then you're not going to see the results appearing in your life. Thanks for the comment. Um, let's have a look. <laughs> Amy Leonard. One month out of the loop. I love my Craig Beck T-shirt. Clear mind, more energy. Amy, we need a picture of you in, in the T-shirt, please. Um, let's have a look. Oh, that's interesting. Ransom Raven says, if you click your username, you actually see two streams and only one has video. How strange. Okay. Um, RV man on the 421, by doing it, do you remain present? By doing it, do you remain present as in not dwell in the past? I'm trying to do this. Um, okay. For, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, the 421 journal is uh, its like a gratitude journal. I'll do a complete video on it later in the week. It's all about the now, RV man. It's The past is gone. We can't change that. The future doesn't exist. It's about now. And when you state your intentions at the end of the journal, 
you should state them as though they're already on the way. So, as you know, the last thing you put down is your kind of request of what you want to arrive into your life in the short to medium term. You should phrase that as though it's in the post, it's on the way. So you give thanks for something before it's arrived, but you you know it's coming. Does that make sense? Uh, Clifford said, uh, yeah, my blood pressure went back to being healthy within three months of not drinking. Thank you, Craig. It's amazing stuff. Um, Chris Ball says, first year I stopped drinking, I found myself getting into cooking and drawing, but now I'm in my second year and all that motivation to do that is gone. Is that normal? Um, I, I, I don't... I, so, often... Things change in our lives, and we incorrectly uh, accredit them to something else. So a lot of people stop drinking, and then they say, well, I've stopped drinking, and now I've got all these headaches. Well, how do you know the headaches are caused by stopping drinking and not something else? And how do you know that you're no longer into cooking and drawing because of your sobriety journey? It could be something else that's happened in your life. You know, and everyone goes through phases. I'm terrible for going through really intense obsessive phases with stuff i get really into things i do them like continuously every day and then there will come a point when i just stop and i don't do them ever again like photography i i did photography as a kid and then i didn't do because i was drinking i didn't do any photography for about 20 years and then when i stopped drinking i was a complete complete photography nut I even set up two photography businesses. I was doing baby portraits and uh, weddings. And I did photography like probably 250 days of the year. And now I can't remember the last time I picked up a camera. It's years. So don't make it more dramatic or significant than it is, Chris. It could be just something changed in your life. Not everything is connected to alcohol. Turkish Jade. Um yeah, I do. We have some serious video problems today because we're well down on the numbers. So hopefully we'll be better next week. Um, two plus years sober, waking up to still living in my past life. I believe I'm in phase two. You talked about the divorce being necessary uh, because you were just roommates. Um, yeah. What? What do you want to know, Turkish Jade? You, you want to know how you change your life and what, what needs to change now to kind of move out of the rut that you're in? Is that what you mean? You give me some clarity on that. Anita. Anita was one of those people that thought she was a better driver when she's had a drink than when she was sober. Why did you think that, Anita? What was it that made you think that you were better? Does it seem ridiculous now when you, when you see it with sober eyes? Uh, final maker, Fabio from Niagara Falls. My girlfriend, uh, she's addicted to wine. She's in a very bad spot. I bought your book, but she refused to read it. Any help? It's the, that's, you know, that in 12 years of doing that, that's the toughest question uh, you can ask me. Uh, and I get it often, and I'm never satisfied with the answer I give. Um, it's so tough, Fabio. I think one of the hardest things to live with is to watch someone you love killing themselves with alcohol. And I've been there uh, and I've lived with a, a problem drinker and it's, it's horrible. Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't help my partner back then. I couldn't, in fact, it was the, you know, like I was talking about before, the harder I pushed her, the more she pulled away from me. Uh, so it's super tough. You know, rule number one in this situation is always look after yourself. Look after yourself. Make sure you're not putting her above your needs, all right? Just because she's in a bad place doesn't mean that her needs are more important than yours. You've got to look after your own mental health, and you've got to have, you've got to have standards, okay? Don't keep lowering your standards and what's acceptable to you because the person you're with keeps lowering their standards. There has to be a point where you say enough, all right? Um, you can keep pushing them in the direction of getting some help, 
but you can't force them to do it. And it has to be light touch because the harder you push, the more they'll pull away generally. All right. But just, you know, bear in mind, you should get some help as well. There are support agencies out there for family members of drinkers. So you don't need to do this on your own. Get the advice of other people in your situation. You will f find support groups out there on the internet that will help you with that. Um, two bits of advice. Don't, in fact, three pieces. Don't enable their drinking. All right? Don't have alcohol in the house if you don't want it in the house because they insist on it or they make a fuss about it. Don't enable their drinking. Don't make it easy for them. Make it difficult. Don't lend them money. If they're, uh, you know, they're spending too much money on alcohol and they're not paying their bills or they just want some money to buy alcohol, do not give it to them, no matter how much they object. Uh, two, don't ever lie for them. If people ring you up and say, where was your girlfriend? She was supposed to be at this meeting. Don't lie. Don't say, oh, she was ill that day. Just say you'll have to ask her about that. But don't get into a situation where you're lying and covering up for the drinker. All right? Um, what else? Never make threats that you're not willing to make good on. Ever. So if you are really at the point where you're saying to this person, if you don't stop drinking, I'm leaving you, then you better be prepared to leave them. Because if they carry on drinking and you don't leave them, then everything you say from that point forward is worthless. It has no weight to it. There has to be consequences to, the, to their actions. And unfortunately, a lot of people will have to go a lot further down than they are now before they can turn around and start coming back up. That's just the sad state of things, I'm afraid. I'm sorry it's not a good answer. I, I, I'm, I'm never happy with it. Um, JR, as always, listening on the, uh, the pods. Love this. Thank you. Thank you, JR. Um, Norway Lynn. Once I started feeling overwhelmed, I didn't feel like I could step away to tame my anxiety. It's hard to put me first when my head's saying it's your daughter's birthday. You can't leave any advice. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean, Norway Lynn. You didn't feel like you'd step away from what? From the drinking? Is that what you mean? Just give me a little bit more on that. Um, Turning Tree is here. Good to see you back, Turning Tree. You're very welcome. Uh, Kelly says, my 31-year-old nephew did rehab three years ago and is now a singer on a large cruise line. He posted photos of the other singers partying. I'm concerned he might slip six months at sea with drinkers. What can you do about it, though? You know, it's not, not in your control, is it? Um... Just stay in touch and make sure that he's he's got you to talk to. But y you'll know if he's drinking because he'll go quiet on you. Um, but you worrying about it won't change the situation. It won't make any difference at all. Uh, so it's, we'll just have to wait and see. And then hopefully it's a blip if it does happen and he's, he's back on the, on the wagon. Well, Kelly, you know, what, what can you say to him? You can just remind him of the benefits. You can remind him of where he was. The problem is, I find that we, with alcohol, people are sometimes on railroad railroad tracks. They're, they're going in a direction, and no matter what you say, they're going. But you can do your best, but don't. this is not your responsibility. It's his responsibility. You can give him all the good information, but it will be his choice whether he takes it or not. So don't beat yourself up. This is not, you know, if he drinks again, this is not because you failed him. And you shouldn't you shouldn't accept the blame for that. You'll be there to help him when he wants to repair the situation, yeah? But uh don't put too much weight on your shoulders. It's not it's not your responsibility. Matt uh, you've said in the past you enjoy country music. What's your feeling about booze being such a big topic in country? Uh, I th it's true, it is. 
Uh, one of my favorite country singers, um, who's called Dale. Oh, my memory's so bad these days. What's his name? Dale, Dale Watson, something like that. Virtually every one of his songs is about drinking. Uh, his Probably one of his biggest songs is called I Lie When I Drink, and I drink a lot. <laughs> so sometimes you might see me walking around singing, I lie when I drink, and I drink a lot. It's not a good look for me, I'm telling you. Uh, but he, sell, he sings about specific brands of beer. He talks about... Uh, uh, he talks about waking up and realizing all the horrible stuff you've done. Thanks to tequila. That's the title of one of his songs. Thanks to tequila. It's, you know, it's just, it is what it is, isn't it? It's, that's just the, the genre. You know, you sing about how your dog's dead and your wife's left you and you, and you're going to drink. That's country music, but I still love it. And I still love Nashville. Um, Mick just dropped my children off to hospital. Their grandpa hasn't long. Oh dear. Sorry. Seeing my kids so upset, my go-to was an effing huge bar of chocolate. This is still my go-to after three years. Good man. Good man. Because in those moments, the clown, you know, he, the evil clown that lives in your head, he, he seizes his opportunity. He goes, oh, we got a moment of weakness here. We can get Mick back in. But chocolate's a good go-to. Um, uh, Anita. So if you've just joined us, Anita was one of those people that admitted that uh, she believed that she was a better driver when she'd had a drink than when she was sober. And I asked her how she knew she was a better driver. She says, it's ridiculous now with sober eyes. I never got caught. That is why I thought I was a better driver when drinking. Stupid, I know. Thank you for your program. It saved me. Yeah. Um, and Anita says to Mick, thoughts and prayers being sent to you and your family. Um, Turkish Jade says, I just lost an old friend. He's okay, but he drinks every day, so I had to cut the communication. It's tough. The change uh, the change is good, simple but, simple but not easy. Yeah, sometimes people have to leave your life temporarily. Some people just don't fit anymore. And yeah, it is tough. But like I said, you've got to put yourself first got to put your own well-being first and sob your sobriety has to come number one um janet says i didn't tell my husband that i quit drinking he hasn't said a word do you think he suspects i quit this horrible habit oh yes day 21 of no booze he knows he knows janet he just doesn't want to talk about it probably is he a heavy drinker your husband you know all the let, let me tell you a secret here right if you think your husband or your wife doesn't know about your drinking. If you think you're hiding it from them, you're fooling yourself. They know, especially women, right? If you think your wife doesn't know because you brush your teeth or you swill a bit of mouthwash or you don't drink in the home, you're fooling yourself. She knows. Got radars everywhere. Um, they just don't want to talk about it. It's not, it's not a nice conversation to have. You know, when someone does talk to you about your drinking, it's not the first time they thought about doing it. They wanted to do it months, years ago. It's just an awkward conversation. Um, Elaine, I'm on day four, longest I've managed in months. Okay, good. Keep going forward. Still working through the kick, but I'm confident I'll be okay this time. Just one day at a time, Elaine, yeah? And gratitude for sobriety. Every time you just just stop yourself and be aware, oh, I'm sober. That's an amazing thing. I'm so gra I'm so grateful. I'm so thankful. Kind of moving forward with gratitude is how we do this. Janet, hello from California. Which part of California are you in Janet? My son is in San Francisco. Um. Yeah, we got we're low numbers today, RV man. I think we because we got these video problems because of the time difference problems. Hopefully next week we'll be up for a, a bumper session, but uh, we're plodding on through despite the technical difficulties today. Um, Johnny is live. I'm not worried about the drinkers outside. I'm worried about the drinker within me who loves it. Uh, well, Johnny, if you. St if he still exists, that person inside who still believes there is a benefit to alcohol, 
then what that tells me is you are using willpower to white knuckle your way through this. And as I have said many times, willpower doesn't work. You've got like a 5% chance of success using willpower because if at your core you still believe there is a benefit to alcohol, then you are always going to feel at some point that you are being deprived of something good. And you're not. There is no benefit to alcohol, not one single benefit. And nobody has ever said something to me in 12 years of doing this where I've gone, yeah, you're right. You've got me there. I would encourage you to sign up for today's webinar. Uh, the link is at the bottom of the screen. StopDrinkingExpert.com webinar. Uh, attend the webinar, and I'll talk you through this in detail about why willpower doesn't work, okay? Um, <laughs> I don't want to judge drinkers, but listening to them is a challenge. It really is. Ten they tend to tell the same story five times in a row, and they, they get in the loop. They're like those caterpillars that go round and round and round and round until they die. Eric the Red, thanks for the videos. You're very welcome. Uh, K2. I went to the hotel bar to get takeaway food to my room a few nights ago, and the drinkers there were so obnoxious, it made me happy I quit. No remorse looking at the endless taps and beautiful bottles. Yeah. You know, I always find that when I'm on a transatlantic flight. Um, I get on the flight, and I watch. There's always one or two people in the cabin who, you know, they're on a session. They, they're, they're always pressing the bell to get more alcohol, and they drink continuously. You're on like a 10-hour flight, and you're watching them. And they start off all elegant. You know, they've got the free champagne, and they're, they're acting like the king of the world. And then by five hours into the flight, they just look an absolute mess. And I, I'm always grateful when we land, and I always look over at them and go, I'm so glad that's not me anymore. I'm so glad I don't have to walk through customs get my passport checked, looking like I've been hit by a bus. So, yeah, it's uh, it's strange the way it looks when you look with sober eyes. Um, Todd, 14 months ago, the day after my last drink, I sat my wife down and told her, that's it, I'm not going to drink anymore. She's never had a problem with alcohol, but she said, okay, then I won't either. Fantastic. And... So your wife hasn't had a drink in 14 months either? So you just have an alcohol-free relationship? Isn't that a beautiful thing? Isn't that an amazing thing? It sounds like nothing, but it's just really nice. The alcohol never comes into your home. You never have to worry about who's driving. Are you driving? Am I driving? Who's you know, you don't have any arguments about that. You don't have arguments, I'm not going there because you know, previously you wouldn't have gone because you can't drink. It just takes a big heap of pressure off your relationship, makes things really, really beautiful. Um, let's have a look. Jamie, Jamie Mitchell Robinson, is this really live? Yes, it's live. Uh, hello from Taiwan, Nick. Thank you, Nick. And thank you for all your comments on my YouTube channel. It's always appreciated. Um, uh, let's have a look. Robert Glenn. Craig, I watch your videos all the time. You've been a great help. Calling it poison was the turning point for me. Seven months now. Awesome. Seven months is fantastic. Keep going, Robert. Um, Stephen, I stopped for 38 days, but then relapsed and went on a bender. I'm back to day two. Yeah. Look, um, it happens, Stephen. Relapse happens. Uh, don't make it a bigger deal than it is. That doesn't mean you should be blasé about it. It sucks. It's bad. But it's not the end of the world. Don't, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater and conclude that everything that you learned up to that point didn't work because you drank again. This clown is very devious. He knows exactly what you love, what you hate, what you're scared of. He knows all your secrets, and he can use them against you. So just make sure you get the best tools for the job. Do my course. Read the good books by people like Annie Grace and William Porter, um, Jason Vale. So many good books out there. Um, let's have a look. Wow. Donna, 50 years drinking, half a century drinking, five weeks sober. Superstar. Fantastic. See, it's never too late to start. 
Um, Elaine, the UK will be an hour ahead next week, so 3 p.m. No, it'll still be 2 p.m. <laughs> Why can we stop with this time change nonsense? It's so stupid. Um, it's so stupid that the whole world doesn't change on the same day as well. You know, the United States did it two weeks ago. We do it next week. It's still 2 p.m. in the UK, Elaine, because Cyprus, where I record from, also moves forward one hour, so it's still 2 p.m. Um, Brad, Craig, can you share the story of how you used a safe to stop drinking? I'll do it, and I'll do a video about that, Brad, because it's quite a long story. Uh, and to be fair, it didn't stop me drinking. Well, it did for about two weeks, and then it failed, and it cost me about a thousand UK pounds to fail in spectacular style. In the next, subscribe to my YouTube channel. I make a video in the next couple of days about it. Um. AFC Theo, um, is the benefit not to fit in? Okay, I see. I've started this journey again. Uh, I have a wedding coming up and dreading it already because I'm the only one not drinking and not used to it. Okay. Theo, th there's a few assumptions in your comment there that you've made, you've stated them as fact, and they're not. You won't be the only one. When you're drinking, it feels like, everyone drinks what you'll discover when you become sober is there are sober people everywhere you'll say to a taxi driver oh you know i don't drink it'll come up in conversation and you'll go yeah me too not for 10 years the amount of conversations i've had like that is countless there are so many people who don't drink you just never noticed them before you assumed they were drinking they were standing with a coke in a glass and you thought that's vodka and coke that's bacardi and coke it's just coke they were standing with a sparkling water. You thought that's vodka and tonic. It's just water. There are so many people out there who are sober that just don't talk about it. Yeah? Now, you say the benefit of drinking is to fit in. No, it's not, though, is it? Because, you know, change the drug. And you'll see that what you're saying there doesn't really hold water because... Imagine, all right, even let's let's not be dramatic about that. Let's pick a drug like nicotine, right? Let's say you went to a party, uh, you're a you've never smoked in your life, right? You've never smoked in your life, you're an adult, and you go to a party, and there's 10 people there, and every single person is smoking. Would you feel compelled to smoke? Would you feel like, well, unless I smoke, I'm not gonna fit in here at all? And even if they all said to you, I'm afraid you don't fit in here because you're not smoking, would you really care? Would you go, oh, no, I wish I was a smoker? You'd leave the room and you'd go, what a bunch of idiots, wouldn't you? You wouldn't feel like, oh, I've got to take up smoking now. Why? Because you don't believe that smoking is something that you want in your life. It's not, it's not a debatable point. You don't need it to have a good time. And that's, you know, you might say, well, Craig, you know, nicotine doesn't alter your mental state. Well, you know, alcohol helps you socialize because it alters your mental state. Well, all right, then what about heroin or cocaine? You know, if you went to a party and everyone was injecting heroin, would you feel compelled to also inject heroin? No, you wouldn't. You'd let them do their thing and you would do your thing. Does that mean you can't have fun? No. The only reason people don't, the only reason drinkers don't have fun at a party when they're not drinking is when they believe that they're missing out on it. If you're at a party and you're looking at alcohol thinking, that's disgusting, why would I want to put that in my body? Then you don't feel like you're missing out on anything. So you can just relax. That's the point, you see. Long answer, <laughs> but thank you for the question. Uh, Lee Sanderson, I found you a few days ago halfway through your book, looking at it. Uh, four, four days alcohol-free, good. Um, so, uh, DMC, I'm off drink over two years. I visit my sister, but her husband can't accept I'm sober. He takes offense to it now. We used to drink together in the past, and he acts like I've got a problem because I'm sober. <laughs> yeah. That's just nuts, isn't it? We live in a world where the people who choose not to drink the poison a thought to have a problem. That just shows you the, the twisted thinking of alcohol. 
you're the problem because you won't drink the poison. Uh, soldier of Jesus Christ, I can't stop drinking no matter what. What have you tried, soldier? What do you mean you can't stop drinking? What have you done? Have you been to AA? Have you done my course? Have you done everything? Have you tried everything? Until you've tried everything, you've not failed. You just haven't found the right path for you yet. But if you're just trying to you know, force yourself not to drink, then like I keep saying, you're repeatedly turning up to a gunfight with a knife. You are not using the right tools for the job. Do not try and do this on your own. Uh, Angela, I'm so glad of my decision not to drink alcohol after hearing these real life stories of how detrimental alcohol is. Yeah, did you see the video I made the other day, Angela? I didn't even know this. And I've been doing this 12 years. That alcohol causes blindness. It uh, accelerates age-related vision loss. I mean, that's terrifying, isn't it? Imagine having to choose between drinking, uh, carrying on drinking and going blind, or giving up the thing that you think is the best thing in your life to retain your vision. It's just crazy. Beverly, five months sober, one drink, and I'm drinking again. I feel like a failure. Do you remember the five most dangerous words on planet Earth, Beverly? This is what I talk about in the course. The five most dangerous words you will ever think, hear, or say. Just one drink won't hurt. If you ever hear yourself thinking those five words, punch yourself in the face as hard as you can, because it's the last thing you will hear before months of misery come slapping you about the face, all right? Look, you're not a failure. You've just found another way that he gets you. How did he get you this time? Bank that. Put that in the bank and learn from it. This is another way the evil clown can get me. He says this at this time, and it gets me. And don't fall for it again. Dust yourself down and quietly restart the journey. The secret to success in everything in life is down to two things. Passion and persistence. Refusing to stay down on the mat, no matter how many times you get hit, no matter how many times you get knocked down on that mat, you get back up and you, you try again. Thanks for being here. Keep coming back. Uh, oh, thank you, JR, for the super sticker. Appreciate it. And Joanne echoes my comments there. You are not a failure. Nobody here is a failure. And I failed to stop drinking hundreds of times. I'm not a failure. Nobody here is. We're just at different stages on the journey. Um, Reyes, I don't think we've had someone from Zambia on before, but you're very welcome. Thank you. Um, let's have a look. Jamie Michelle Robinson, I've done your course, but I still struggle. I think my biggest struggle is to love and care about myself enough. Yeah. Uh, if, if you've got to log into the members area, Jamie, there's a course you can add on, which is called Unleashed from Alcohol. And that's exactly what it's about. It's not about stopping drinking. It's about learning to love yourself. It's learning to accept your failings, accept your weaknesses, accept your strengths, and just make peace with the past, make peace with all those demons that you have and the guilt and the regret from the past and move forward kind of with from a, a new starting point. And the whole course is it's got nothing to do with quitting drinking. It's all about learning to accept yourself, living with passion, finding your purpose in life. So take a look at that in the members area. Um, let's have a look. Oh, bad boy 22. Hi, Craig. Hope you're doing well. It's Patrick from Hull. Past the three-year mark now and still going strong. Fantastic. Which part of Hull are you from, um, bad boy? Um, I lived on Vicky Dock for a couple of years. Um, let's have a look. What else we got? We're going to wrap up soon because we've had a 
troublesome stream today. Technology has not been on our side. Time has not been on our side, and I apologize. It's not been a it's not been a blinder today, but um, we'll be back next week, and it'll all be fixed. Um, let's have a look. Brad, thank you for giving us a tour of your boat. I really enjoyed that video. I like when you do videos outside your office and show us how beautiful Cyprus is. Oh, okay. I'll try and do more of that. Thank you very much. Um, Nick, I love to hear you a bit about the five words and what to do in that case. I always keep it in my mind. I'm serious. People think I'm joking. Punch yourself in the face. You need to be in the bathroom cleaning the blood off your nose so that you're so distracted by what you've done to yourself that you don't drink. Bourneville keeps missing the live stream. Um, next week. Uh, Beverly says, thank you, Craig. You're welcome. Uh, are you showing off now, Bourneville? It's been really hot here. You would not believe how cold it is in Cyprus at the moment. It's eight degrees. My God, this has been the coldest, longest winter I've ever known in Cyprus. Um, Elaine says, I found that tapping is my newest best friend. Now, as I actually feel a rush of good feelings when I tap. My favorite place is my chin. It's kept me sober during days three and four, which have always been my hardest days. Okay. Uh, I will make a video about tapping as well, because I'm guessing some people are listening going, what are you talking about? Tap dancing? Uh, there's something called tapping therapy, where you tap on meridian points in the body, and it prevents the, the body from releasing cortisol, which is a stress hormone. And it's very effective against cravings. So we'll do a video about that in the next week or so. Kelly. Craig, I stopped drinking with seemingly seemingly with ease after 30 years, thanks to your program. After that, I thought quitting smoking would be a breeze, but I can't get that same mindset. Any suggestions? Um, I would encourage you to get the same level of help that you got with your drinking. A very good friend of mine called Mark Keane is a smoking cessation therapist. He's been doing it for 20 years, I think now. A uh, very good success rate. And in fact, if you go to the YouTube channel uh, and scroll back probably a good couple of weeks now, we did a live session with Mark and he talked about nicotine and smoking. And I believe his contact details are on that video. Uh, he won't mind if you drop him a, a quick message. He might even do a little video chat with you or something. Um, Doug says, thank you for today. You're welcome, Doug. Sorry the technical issues were causing problems. Angie says, London is hot. You know, all these English people showing off now because I'm in Cyprus and it's freezing cold. Um, can one person's addiction trigger another's? For example, a gambler versus a drinker. You mean that if you're... Uh, anything can be a trigger. Um, the problem is we don't really understand what the triggers are because they're subconscious and we can't access our subconscious mind. So... They could be. I'm guessing if you're saying you're a drinker and you live with a gambler and you give up drinking, but they carry on gambling, could that be a trigger? Well, it could be if you have psychological links between uh, their gambling and your drinking. But it's it's hard to know. That's why you have to be kind of a little bit hyper aware in certain situations. So that if you if you're in an environment where that other person is in, indulging in their addiction and you then feel a craving instead of just automatically responding to that craving, you stop and you go, okay, what's happening here? Uh-huh, all right, yeah, I see the link. And you get yourself out of that situation. You do a pattern interrupt. You don't let the program complete. Because the program in your head that's been there for many years wants to complete. It wants to get from start to end. You must not let it end. Because every time it ends, the program gets stronger. And every time you stop it, it weakens. So the goal is there to interrupt the pattern before it gets a chance to play out, if that makes sense. Um, oh, Ho'oponopono, yeah. A few people are watching the, the boat tour video were asking uh, what my the tattoos on my wrists say. Uh, they are Ho'oponopono. They're in, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Thank you. I love you in Greek. Uh, what's that one there? Hannah, are you going to start boot camps again? Uh, I hope so. I hope so too. Uh, it's just been, it's been two years since I did one. I'm not sure I can remember the script. It's like a four hour script. Uh, but 
the plan is to to bring them back. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to. We just need to uh, wait for this coronavirus to completely settle, and then we'll we'll get back on the road. Um, let's have a look. Let's give the last comment here to Bad Boy from Hull. Uh, I did Craig's program over three years ago, and I was a big drinker. I've never looked back. The evil clown pops up now and again, uh, but that's all he does. He just pops up, and I make him go away. Yeah, he'll keep trying. He'll he'll never stop. He'll just the the time between his attempts will get longer and longer, and he'll get so weak eventually that it'll only pop up when you're really really low or you're having a really big challenge, like someone died or something like that. Uh, you just observe what he's doing and laugh at him is the best advice I can give you. So that's it for today. Uh, once again, apologies for the time difference problems. Apologies for the technical problems for YouTube viewers. I don't know what happened there. I'm going to just cross my fingers and hope that next week everything will be perfect. So thanks so much for being with me. Uh, have a, another amazing sober weekend if I don't speak to you before then. And don't forget, there's another new video coming out tomorrow, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday.